Good morning, Eastside Baptist Church. It's good to see everybody here this morning. Please stand with us as we sing this morning, Immortal, Invisible. Lift your voices high in the Lord this morning. Almighty, victorious, thy great name we praise. Unresting, unhasting, and silent as night, nor wanting, nor wasting, thou rulest in might. Thy justice like mountains, thy soaring above, thy clouds which are mountains of goodness and You may be seated. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Hope y'all are doing all right this morning. Uh, we are going to be reading from Psalm 119, uh, verses 113 to 120 this morning. Y'all go ahead and turn there. Um, while you're turning there, if you're a guest with us this morning... Uh, the bottom portion of your bulletin, you can tear that off if you would fill it out and put it in the offering plate when it comes by. Uh, that just lets us know that you were here, um, gives us a chance to follow up with you, just check in uh, on you as a church family. We just want to love you the best we can. We want to pray for you if there's a way we can pray for you. Um, so yeah, if you're willing, if you would put that in the offering plate. I don't have any announcements this morning. Um, and nobody has given me any. So check your bulletin. There are some announcements there. I assume if anything's important, you'll see it right there. Um, all right, let's get to our scripture reading this morning. Again, that's Psalm 119, verses 113 to 120. I hate those who are double-minded, but I love your instruction. You are my shelter and my shield. I put my hope in your word. Depart from me, you evil one, so that I may obey my God's commands. Sustain me as you promised, and I will live. Do not let me be ashamed of my hope. Sustain me so that I can be safe, 
and always be concerned about your statutes. You reject all who stray from your statutes, for their deceit is a lie. You remove all the wicked on earth as if they were dross from metal. Therefore, I love your decrees. I tremble in all of you. I fear your judgments. Let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, I pray that uh, this morning as we gather for worship, our heart would be to do just that, to worship you, uh, to hear a word that will just bring us closer to you. Uh, God, that we would have just love for you, um, that we would not hold back, that we would uh, sing with everything we have, that we would look to you, that we would just lay ourselves aside and make this morning about you and who you are. Um, God, I pray that, as always, we would uh, have the strength and the courage to share your love with those around us when you give us the opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen. And I'm going to invite you, if you'd like, to stand with us again as we continue our worship in song this morning, singing about God's greatness, how great thou art. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for the worship that we have in song. We thank you for our, our Sunday school hour and the message that we received from your word. Father, we ask that you be with Preacher Mike this morning as he brings us the message, that it, it be what we need to hear, that we be attentive. Father, we just ask as we come to this time of the service that you bless, bless the gift and the giver. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. We are blessed this morning to have Brother Mike Bearden come and preach for us. Brother Mike is, uh, and, and he likes to be called Preacher Mike, so we got that squared up right off the bat. Preacher Mike. Preacher Mike is uh, married for 51 years. He said he got married when he was 15 years old. <laughs> he has three children and he has five grandchildren. He is a blessed man. His wife is named Iris, and she's on a trip, not with him this morning, but she'll be with him at the times that he comes back and preach. He was kidding with us the other day when we met, and he says that um, he was the preacher and she was the pastor, and that's a real good mix right there, real good mix. Be pro he preached for 26 years at Fountain Inn First Baptist. He's been interim for nine years. He was interim at Mount Pisgah. Jones Avenue and Flat Rock. Those are the local ones right around close to us. We have talked with several people. I was kidding him this morning that we got his resume and he said, I didn't send a resume. I said, it's not written. <laughs> his resume is not written down. It's from people telling us uh, what kind of man he is, what kind of preacher he is, and how awesome God is using him. And we're just really, really blessed to be able to have this young man come and preach to us this morning. We're going to vote as soon as the, the uh, service is over. Y'all be praying that God would just uh, give you the right words, the, the right vision, the right thinking, and uh, just praying for Brother Mike that God would just turn him loose and let him preach. Y'all pray for him. Come ahead. started to look and see if we were talking about the same guy, Larry. I, I feel strange getting up here after that kind of introduction, but my wife will be here next time I come, if I come, I hope I get to come back, and she can tell you different. All that is just a bunch of, that's what she'd say. We're not talking about the same guy, but anyway, I do appreciate that kind introduction. 
or y'all look like a mule looking at a new gate. <laughs> How are you this morning? Amen. Are you glad you're here? Amen. I'm glad to hear, be here too. Of course, at my age, I'm glad to be most anywhere, but uh, it is good to see you. I tell you what, I have never been to your church here for a worship service, but I grew up in Anderson, South Carolina, just down the road, and I would hear about your church every once in a while through the years, and it was always good. And I've always had the impression that this is a good church. Do y'all believe that? Amen. Look at your neighbor and tell them this is a good church. Amen? Amen. Really? I've always had uh, positive responses from people when I heard about Eastside. A friend of mine, Ralph Carter, 100 years ago was pastor here. Not 100 years ago, back in the 80s, I guess. I believe uh, Brother Larry Davis was the interim here at one point, and I got to know Larry when I was at Flat Rock. I understand that Bo has just passed away. Is that correct? And uh, I hope you'll be praying for Larry. He's a good man, great man of God, and I enjoyed getting to know him. But I've always had some positive responses from folks when we talked about Flat, uh, Flat Rock, yes, but Eastside Baptist Church, too, and and it's been my privilege to be up in this area through the years with Mount Pisgah and Jones Avenue and found some wonderful people in these churches. And I'm sure I'm going to find that here, right, Terry? Terry said he was at Simpsonville, ran the Corral Restaurant about 1987 when I went to Fountain Inn. And I remember Brian Hester, who is now worship pastor at Pickens First Baptist, he was my worship pastor, and he said, we need to go to the Corral Restaurant, Preacher Mike, and have lunch, and we did, and I think Terry owned that, and it was very good, and then he shut it down, and I don't know, did you sell it to McDonald's or whatever, so made a lot of money, I understand, so, <laughs> okay, all right. I cannot preach a profound sermon, but I can give you a profound text. Found in the Gospel of John, if you'll take your Bibles, turn to the Gospel of John. An old story about a theologian speaking in a particular university, I suppose. And after he finished speaking, they were going to have a question and answer period. And a student asked him, Dr. So-and-so, what is the most profound thing you've ever heard, profound subject that you've ever come across, maybe a verse in the Bible, the mo most profound Bible verse in your whole career. And he kind of closed his eyes, bowed his head, put his hand to his chin. There was silence for a few moments. And this is what he said. Would you stand in the honor of reading God's word, John 3.16? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Father, thank you, Lord, so much for this verse. I really believe this was the first verse that I ever memorized as a young Christian. Bless my heart. And it's such a simple verse, but it's probably the most profound verse in the whole Word of God. Lord, I pray that you'll help me, if I could today, to unpack this verse, that we could understand it better, more clearly, have a greater appreciation for it. But most of all, if there's somebody here today who does not know Jesus as Lord and Savior, maybe somebody listening to me by streaming or whatever else, uh, somebody maybe would take this verse and because of this verse and the meaning of this verse and the Savior that it proclaims to us be saved. And we'll thank you for that. And we make our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much. If you'll look at that verse very closely, you'll realize that all of the other scriptures in the Bible find their origin in that verse, 66 books in the Bible, 1,189 chapters in the Bible, 31,175 verses in the Bible, but they can all be boiled down to their barest essence, to, and you'd get this verse right here. This is a wonderful verse of Scripture. 
And it is a single statement giving us a picture of the mind of God, the heart of God, and what salvation is all about. Now, some people do believe that this is the greatest verse of Scripture in the entire Bible, and some have said that it's the greatest sentence ever written by mankind. There's an old story that many years ago, I believe in the 1870s, in the sands of Egypt, somebody found this large, giant red shaft, and they called that thing Cleopatra's Needle. And so men took this to England and reconstructed that shaft, 69 feet high, And when they erected Cleopatra's needle, they also decided to put into that a time capsule. A time capsule. And they put a vault there. And they put this time capsule in the the vault so that succeeding generations who may one day open that thing up could find out what England was like at that particular time. So they put all kinds of interesting things in that vault. They decided that they would put in that vault different things that would tell people what that time period in England was like, but also in that vault, in 220 languages and dialects of the world, they put this verse, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That is a wonderful verse. In fact, if all of the other verses in the Bible were lost except this one verse, there's enough gospel message in this one verse to save the whole world. It is so simple. It's so simple that my wife, at the age of eight years old, her mother shared with her the plan of salvation, and she got saved. And yet it is so very profound that I don't think anybody's going to get to the depths of the meaning of this verse as it really is. But I'm going to try. Now, here in this verse, we see, see the real heart of God, the real mind of God about salvation. So there are three things I want to share with you. I have three points this morning. Sometimes I have three points. Sometimes I have two points in my messages. Sometimes one point. Sometimes my sermons are pointless. But anyway, that didn't come out quite right. But anyway, three points I've got for you. Here's the first one. I want you to notice in this verse the source of salvation. This verse tells us where salvation begins. And what does it say? It says, for God. For God so loved the world. In other words, the source is in the love of God. Now, before Jesus came, people did not think of God as a God of love. In fact, the gods of most people of that day were rather angry gods. They were rather vindictive gods. And it was difficult for people to understand that God is love. But you know, when Jesus came and Jesus lived his life the way he lived his life and loved the people the way he did and then gave his life on the cross for us, then people could begin to understand that God is love. Ladies and gentlemen, God is love. When I was at Fountain Inn First Baptist Church in our little preschool area, we would teach verses of the Bible to our preschoolers, and we would also do it to our children. We would have them memorize verses. One of the first verses we'd have our children memorize is this verse right here that says, God is love. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. God is love. Now, God is love. And if you see that, it says, for God so loved the world, and the tense of the verb there is past tense. God so loved the world. But now don't let that throw you when you hear that past tense, that God loved the world. And I say that because the Bible teaches that God has no, God's love has no beginning and no ending. God's love has no beginning and no ending. But I want you to know there was never a time when God began to love you. He's always loved us. You say, how do you know that, preacher Mike? Well, Jeremiah 31, 3, God says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. In other words, it is a love that had no beginning, and it's a love that has no ending, and it's amazing to to me to think, I, I can't even conceive of that, that God has always loved me. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you may go away from here today, and you may not remember anything else I say, but I want you to remember this. God loves you. I have a friend who was at Monaghan Baptist Church, great man of God, a layman, Charlie Forrester. And everybody Charlie would talk with in his business, 
out in the world, he'd say, you know what, Terry? And Terry would say, know what, Charlie? He'd say, God loves you. And I love you too. And that's the idea. God loves you. But here's the thing I want you to notice. There's a little bitty word there that qualifies that idea. And it says, for God so loved the world. What does that mean? Different translations have tried to help us understand it. So here's one translation that says, God loved the world so very much. Another translation says, God loved the world so dearly. Well, what does it mean when we say that God loved this world? Well, we could say that it means that God's love is like an overflowing river. God's lo love is like a bottomless ocean. Volumes can be found in that little word. You could spend a lifetime plumbing the depths of that little word, and you would still never grasp the complete meaning of the word so. Now, my wife loves to sing. That's uh, one of her talents. She enjoys singing, and when I twist her arm real good, I can get her to sing a song that's one of my favorite songs called The Love of God. I love the third verse of that song, The Love of God. It says, Could we with ink the ocean fill, and were the skies of parchment made, were every stalk on earth a quill, and every man a scribe by trade, to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. Well, it says down here, God so loved the world. But I want you to notice the object of God's love. What is the object of God's love? Well, it's the world. That's what it says down here. God so loved the world. Well, what world is that talking about, Preacher Mike? Is that talking about this terra firma upon which we walk? You know, when you observe what kind of world this is, and this is talking about the world of mankind, God so loved the world of mankind. I don't know about you, but a thought pops in my mind. How could that be? Do y'all ever watch the news? I sit down, I watch the news every night, not because I want to, but I feel like I need to kind of keep up with what's going on. I mean, it's amazing to me that the source of love that begins at the throne of God and which is infinite in its capacity and intensity is a love which has as its object this world. And then I watch the news and I see where somebody walks into a schoolroom full of little children with an automatic weapon and starts shooting. And I think to myself, God, how could you love a world like this? You know what? You listening? God loves that man. Another man haunts the streets of a community taking young ladies in the prime of life, abuses them sexually, hacks their bodies up, and destroys their lives. That's awful. But God loves that person. And I'm having a hard time conceiving of that until I met a man named Raymond Hargrave. You don't know him. Raymond is incarcerated in the state prison system for murder. Some years ago, he, called, he, he, he sent word to me, he sent a letter to me back in those days at our church. We had a radio broadcast every Sunday morning, 11 o'clock. And in the prison, he had listened to the radio broadcast, so he sent me a letter. He said, I want you to come see me. You know what I did with that letter? I threw it in the trash can. I thought that's just jailhouse religion. A few weeks later, he wrote me another letter, and he said, Preacher Mike, I realize that you probably are skeptical of my first letter, but I want you to understand that I've been saved. I really want you to come visit with me. Well, that got my attention. And I went and visited with Raymond. And Raymond committed murder. He broke into a man's house in Simpsonville, thinking nobody was home. He was going to steal some things for drugs. The man happened to be home. There was a scuffle. Raymond murdered him. It took him a while to be able to admit that. So probably now for 27 years, I've been visiting him several times in the prison system, talking to him, and he is a dynamic Christian. Now, he murdered the man. He'll tell you I murdered the man. But you know what? God loves Raymond Hargrave. God loved him enough to save him. 
Now, God does not condone the sinful actions that take place by people in this world every day, and God will judge those actions someday if they're not repented of, but our sinful actions or the judgment God may have to bring upon them do not for one moment lessen the love of God for us. Not one moment. You take a mother's child, that mother's child does not always please her in its actions, but misbehavior never dulls the love that mother has for that child. And that's true of God in a much greater way. God so loved the world. Everybody in it. That includes you. Somebody says, well, preacher Mike, what makes it possible for God to love a world that is so sinful and ugly and polluted? Well, friend, if you're really honest, you'll admit that most of the time your love and my love has to depend upon the desirability of the object. In other words, if you behave, I'll love you. If you don't behave, I won't love you. That's kind of the love, that's the way we approach love from our point of view. But God's not that way. The Bible says the love of God originates in God's nature, in God's heart. God is love. That verse means that love and God are all wrapped up together. Love is the very nature of God, and the desirability of the object has nothing to do whatsoever with whether God, God loves you or not. Please don't ever tell a child, and I've heard parents do this, if you do that, God won't love you anymore. That's poor theology. That's just not right. Now, they don't need to misbehave, but God still loves them. God so loved the world, and that includes everybody who has ever lived, who is living, who will ever live, and that can make you feel small if you think about yourself in contrast to the millions of people who've ever lived. Do I have any Clemson Tiger fans here that will admit it? Dear will. Well, I grew up in Anderson, almost under the shadow of Clemson University. I'm, I'm a big Clemson Tiger fan. I remember years ago, the first time I ever went to a Clemson football game, and, and it wasn't near as big as it is now. They'd never won a championship at that time. Smaller stadium. But still, I had never been in a crowd of people that big. And I remember walking into that stadium. I had never seen a crowd that big, and I felt about that small. I thought to myself, who am I in all this crowd, this mass of humanity? Do you know what? God does not look at us as masses. He looks at us one by one. One of the early church fathers, St. Augustine, said, God loves each one of us as if there were only one of us to love. Somebody says, well, preacher, you don't know what I've done. Boy, I've heard that, and Robert has too, all my life. We'd be witnessing somebody, preacher Mike, you don't know what I've done. Well, you're right, I don't know. But I do know that regardless of what you've done, God loves you. Listen to this and think about this. You cannot be bad enough to cause God to stop loving you. And that does not mean that God won't deal with your sinful actions if you insist on pursuing them, but it does mean that God will still love you, just like that mother who has to discipline her child for misbehavior still loves that little child. God loves you, and this is what salvation is all about. We learn here the source of salvation, for God so loved the world. But now here's point number two. Not only the source of salvation, I want you to understand and see the sacrifice of salvation. For God so loved the world that he gave. See that word gave? And it's right here that we focus in on the real meaning of salvation. God gave. You see, God's love is a giving kind of love. God's love is a giving kind of love. You know, the test of love is found in the lengths to which it will go to express itself. The real test of love has to do with the amount of sacrifice it's willing to make. It concerns how the love will demonstrate itself. Like this old boy wrote a note to his girlfriend, and he, and he said to her, Mary, dear Mary, I love you. I love you so much I'd climb the highest mountain for you. I love you so much I'd swim the deepest ocean for you. Mary, I'd go through the darkest jungle for you. And P.S., if it doesn't rain Friday night, I'll come over to see you. <laughs> well, 
Love demonstrates itself by the sacrifices it will make. I think back to my wife when we kind of got sweet on each other and the relationship was deepening and strengthening and we were being drawn together. And so I popped the question. We went to a real swanky restaurant sitting outside in a Volkswagen Beetle. Shoney's restaurant, over a hot fudge cake, I popped the question. And she said, yes. Now that's the way I took it, but she made just a minute after that first bite, she said, yeah. <laughs> but no, I took it, you know, you understand what I'm saying. But you know, as an expression of my love for her, I wanted to give her a ring. So I went to Phil Jewelers, downtown Anderson. I talked to Phil Silverstein and I said, I need to get a diamond ring. So they brought these diamond rings out and they put them against the, the backdrop of black velvet, put them under these lights, and those things are just twinkling and carrying on. And I said, I think I like that one. And so you know what I did? I was working the State Forester Commission, going to college at that time. I didn't have any money, so I put it on layaway. Do they still do that? Do they do layaway now? I don't know if they do it or not. But that means, you know, they'll keep the ring, but you make payments on it, you know, over, over a period of time until you pay that thing out. And that was a sacrifice. I worked hard in that blazing sun to buy that ring. Sacrifice. Love demonstrates itself by the sacrifices it will make. Let me tell you what. God demonstrated His great love for us because He sacrificed. What did He sacrifice? Well, His Son. Y'all know Hallmark cards, you know the Hallmark greeting cards? And the Hallmark, I don't know if they still do this, but they used to have as their theme, when you care enough to send the very best. Well, that's what God did. God cared enough to send His very best, His Son, but not just His Son. Notice the verse says that it was His only begotten Son. Now, there are a couple of ways you can understand that word begotten. It can mean only one. That's his only one. It's only one son, not two, not more than that. Only one. Jesus was the only son the Father had to give us. I have three sons. I've got two here, one in heaven. Folks, I know what it's like to lose a son. I don't ever want to go through that again. Don't want to do that. I got two sons still. But I lost one. You see, God the Father just had one son. And yet he loved us so much that he was willing to give that only begotten son to die for us. But not only was that, that word uh, begotten mean only one, it also means unique. Jesus, his son, was unique. He was unique in his birth. Do you like riddles? Here's one for you. Jesus was the only person ever born into this world who had an earthly mother, but he had no earthly father. He had a heavenly father, but no heavenly mother. He was the only one ever born who was as old as his father and older than his mother. <laughs> he was unique in his birth, see. He was unique in his life. He's the only person to ever lived who's never done anything wrong, didn't ever think anything wrong. And I think about that, and I, I have a struggle every day. Things pop into my mind. Where'd that come from? Jesus, I don't want that. But Jesus was not like that. He lived a perfect life. He was unique in his death, dying for the sins of the whole world. And then when he died, he did not stay dead, but he broke the chains of death and rose again from the dead. Amen? You see, God gave his only begotten son. He gave the very best that he had, and he gave his son because there was no other way to be saved. And if you're out there trying to live a good, perfect life in order to get to heaven, stop it. Because it is completely impossible, and you need to trust Jesus because he's the only way to be saved. If it wasn't, why did God give his son? God gave his only son, and that's the sacrifice of salvation. But now I said there were three points. Point number one, the source of salvation Point number two, the sacrifice of salvation. Now number three, the scope of salvation. Look what it says. 
that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And there's several things I want to say about the scope of salvation. Number one, it reaches down to humanity. In fact, the Bible says, whosoever believes in him. Say that word, whosoever. Let me ask you a question. Are there any whosoever's in here? Yes, sir. Every one of us in here fit this category. Whosoever reaches to everybody on the face of the earth. Now, mankind has his prejudices, doesn't he? But I want you to know there is no prejudice in the heart of God. Salvation is for the black man as well as the white man. Salvation is for the Arab as well as the Jew. Salvation is available to anybody and everybody. There was a song I, I learned when I was in preschool 100 years ago. Red, yellow, black, and white, they are precious in his sight. That includes everybody. The Bible says, whosoever will, let him come. And that whosoever means you. Friend, if you are lost without Jesus Christ, let me tell you that if you want to be, you can be saved today. Whosoever will, let him come. The Christ of salvation will save you. That whosoever included the Samaritan woman at the well. It included that military officer, that Gentile Roman army officer, Cornelius. It included that black man, most likely, that Philip baptized, Book of Acts, the Ethiopian eunuch. And it can include you, just you, anybody, everybody, whosoever will, let him come. Reaches down to humanity. But now listen to this. Did you know it also rescues from hell? It rescues from hell because hell is in that verse. Whosoever believeth in him, talking about Jesus, should not perish. Should not perish. Hell is in that word perish. Now, some people, be, some people today believe, Preacher Mike, I just believe everybody's eventually going to go to heaven. Not. Bible doesn't teach that. Well, I just it's not up to your feelings. The Bible does not teach that. That's not what Jesus taught. Jesus taught that a man who dies in his sins will go to hell and perish. Now let me say, you will go to hell if you're unsaved, but you will not go to hell unloved. God loves you. But you can go to hell if you don't know Jesus. And here's what Jesus did. He warned us not to go there. And Jesus knew it was so bad, he did not want us to go there. He warned us not to go there. And listen, folks, what is salvation all about if there is no hell? Several years ago, there was a preacher. He'd been a pastor for a number of years. Had one of the largest churches in America. And I don't know what got wrong with that guy. But he quit his church, wrote a book. In the book, he said, there's no such thing as hell. Let me tell you what, folks. What is salvation all about if there's no hell? Why did Jesus have to come to this world anyway if there's no hell? What was the purpose of Jesus coming and dying on a cross if people are not perishing in their sins? But here's the reality. People are perishing in their sins. Every day they're dying in their sins. And Christ was born into this world that we might one day go that he might go to the cross and provide a means of escape for all of us who are destined to hell for otherwise. You know, the text says that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have, ever, have everlasting life. I got a little grandson now, my oldest grandson. One grand boy has already been saved. This is my oldest grandson, and he's asking questions, and he's thinking about he heaven and hell, and he's, he's saying, I want to go to heaven. His daddy told me that the other day. He's getting close. Y'all pray for me. He'll be safe soon. All my grandchildren. He wants to have everlasting life. He doesn't want to go to hell. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish. But, that little word, but, that's a great word. Called up in that little word is the hinge of man's hopes. Should not perish, but. Boy, that's a great thought. This is the thought. You don't have to go to hell. When I was growing up in Anderson, I ran with the wrong crowd. I had a group of guys. We got into things we shouldn't get into. 
And I remember one discussion. We were, we were just, I think we were just in middle school at that time. They were having a discussion before school one day. I don't know why they got on spiritual matters. But they got to talking and they said, well, I guess I'm going to hell someday. Well, here's the good news for you. You don't have to. You don't have to go to hell. God loves you so much that he wants you to share heaven with him. Now, all of us are going to die someday unless Christ comes back first. And that could be a real reality. But if he doesn't come back, everybody in this room is going to die someday. Iris and I were traveling in Arizona a few years ago. And, of course, we went down to Tucson and Tombstone and went out to Boot Hill at Tombstone. I was looking at all the graves out there. And, you know, I came across this one grave that said something like this. Here lies Les Moore who died from a bullet from a 44, no less, no more. We're all going to die someday. Where are you going? What is your destiny before, beyond death? What's going to happen to you when you die? Well, Preacher Mike, I've got, I'm, I'm a young person. I've got a number of years left. You may not have as many as you think. You see this gray hair? I've been in the ministry a long time. I buried people from little babies who did not even get the light, the air, a, a breath of day, a breath of life. I buried children. I buried teenagers. I could tell you some stories. I buried older people. The oldest one I've ever buried is 107 years old. But like Genesis chapter 5 says, and he died, and he died, and he died. Friend, you're going to die someday. What then? You only have two, two possibilities. There's heaven, there's hell. And what's going to happen to you? Well, preacher Mike, what do I have to do to have eternal life? That whosoever believeth in him. Well, I believe in Jesus. I know he was the son of God. I know he died on the cross to save us from our sins. I know all these, these things about him. You know what you call that? Mental assent. That's having a lot of ideas and thoughts in your mind about Jesus. Now, my wife is a school teacher. Of course, she's retired now, but still teaching some substitute teaching. And she, she teaches the kid history. She, that's what she teaches. And so, you know, I remember when I was in school, they told me that George Washington was the first president of the United States. Okay. I've never met George. I've never seen him in person. But somebody told me that. Okay, I believe that. All right, George was the first president. I mean, I really don't know. They're just telling me this. So I've got this in my mind, a fact in my mind that's called mental assent. I believe that Jesus was the Son of God, that he died on the cross, rose from the dead, all that's in my mind, that's mental assent. The only thing about that is that the Bible says in the book of James that the demons believe that. They know all that. So salvation is not enough just thinking those things and saying, I agree with that. Somewhere along the way, you've got to move it from here down to here. I say approximately 18 inches. Some people are going to miss heaven by 18 inches. Because you've got to get your knowledge about Jesus from here to here. And that's what that word believe means. It's the idea where you make a commitment of your life to Jesus Christ. A friend of mine had heart surgery this past Thursday. She had six bypasses. She did not want to do that. But she had to either do that or die. And so very reluctantly she agreed to have heart surgery. Dr. Davis was her surgeon. He came in and talked to her about the surgery. She agreed to have the surgery. She did have the surgery, six bypasses. And during that time, now, when she met Dr. Davis, she thought, you know, I believe he can help me. I don't have any assurance about it, but I believe he can. I've heard good things about him, good heart surgeon. I believe all this. So I'm, Doc, I'm scared. I don't want to do this but I'm going to trust you to take care of me about my health. You know what? She came through wonderful. She's doing wonderful. Well, now take that and translate that spiritually. Here's Jesus. 
They tell me that he died on the cross, rose from the dead. Okay, I, I believe that. But it's not enough to do that. You've got to exercise your will and commit yourself to the Lord Jesus. In your heart, in a simple little prayer, you can just say, Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I'm sorry for my sins. I accept you right now as my Lord and Savior. Best I know how I receive you as my Lord and Savior. And the Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That word believe means you make a commitment to the Lord Jesus with your life. Have you done that? Jerry Vines has preached in the area some, and he's one of my favorite preachers. And I heard him give this illustration some years ago, so I'm going to use it. I'm going to borrow it from him. In a little home for children, there was a little girl who was rather shy, unattractive, shunned by the other children, and really the officials of the home kind of considered the little girl a bit of a problem. They were looking for some excuses to get rid of her and maybe send her on to another home. And then one day they saw that little girl slip away through the fields and trees on the place. And they began to watch to see what she was doing. And they watched her climb up into a tree and they watched her deposit something in a hollowed out place in the tree. And when the little girl left, the officials hurried to the tree, reached into the hollow, found a note the little girl had written. And they opened up the note and read the note. Here's what it said. To anybody who finds this, I love you. God sent his son Jesus to die on a cruel cross. And then God put in the Bible, John 3, 16, that says, to anybody who finds this, I love you. Amen. I ask you to bow your heads, please. Close your eyes. I'm going to ask the musicians to come and prepare for our invitation hymn. Robert, I'm going to ask you to stand here, please. As we sing in just a moment, if there's something that you need to do for Jesus today, if there's a spiritual decision that you need to make, why don't you come take Brother Robert by the hand? You've gotten to know him. He loves churches. He loves you. And just tell him your decision. And he can counsel with you, help you any way that needs to be done. If you've never been saved, pray right now. Ask Christ to come into your heart and you slip down this aisle and share that with Brother Robert. If there's some other decision that you need to make today, you come down this aisle during this time of singing and talk to Brother Robert. He'll help you. And we'll be praying for you when you come. Father, I pray now, Lord, as we come into this time of invitation, that you'll move in this room and have your will and your way. And we'll give you the glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand now as we sing, please. Everybody stand.